Good morning. Sermonic theme for today is living faithfully, living faithfully. Any of you who have been watching the news or have an inkling of information on the Israeli-Palestinian situation, I imagine feels a depth of sadness. In the world of social media, I have been able to listen to people on the ground, ranging from journalists to live discussions with both sides present, to victims, to civilians. It is the people, inevitably, who will pay drastically for the decisions of political forces. It is the body count that keeps rising. It is the hospitals filled beyond capacity. Hostages ripped from their families. Among the tons of messages, I recall vividly a grandmother of one of Scotland's leaders recording a video. She was visiting her family in Gaza and is now trapped. She begins with this. This will be my last video. One million people, no food, no water, and still they are bombing them as they leave. But my thoughts are that all these people in the hospital cannot be evacuated. Where's the humanity? Where's people's heart in the world? May God help us all. Goodbye. This is where we enter the biblical text today. The future for this community has never looked so uncertain <clears throat> as communities have been ripped apart by unspeakable devastation. To the point many are leaving messages with the understanding that they may die. Paul also was writing a letter while he was in jail and he was very uncertain about his future as well. He was living in some dismal times and persecution leading to death was not off the table. And yet in these most uncertain of times, he was still doing ministry. He was still reaching out to the communities in which he served. He was still being faithful to the life he had been called to live. I'm reminded of another person who was in jail writing letters, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was in jail for his involvement in a protest. He wrote a letter from Birmingham, Alabama. This letter was written in response to a public statement issued by eight white clergymen. They questioned his involvement in a whole other state he didn't live in. They questioned him rallying up the feathers of people. Ironically, in his response, he mentions Paul. He mentions Paul being all over the place in other places and how his call to justice situated him in different states. He explains to them, you deplore our presence, but not the conditions which have necessitated our presence. He answers their questions and he tries to explain to them that they had tried negotiations, that they had tried coming to the table, that they had tried to sit down and talk, that they had tried to do what they were suggesting first. And then he breaks down nonviolent protests. And here are a few of his words. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself, and that is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom, and something without has reminded him that it can be gained. If one recognizes this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand why public demonstrations are taking place. The Negro has many pent-up resentments and latent frustrations 
and he must release them. So let him march. Let him make prayer pilgrimages to the city hall. Let him go on freedom rides and try to understand why he must do so. If his repressed emotions are not released in nonviolent ways, they will seek expression through violence. This is not a threat. It's just a fact of history. It is in good in easy times to live our lives well. It is easy when we are privileged to go about our lives with ease and comfort. But a significant portion of our life is anything but easy. And what do we do? What do we do when struggles come? What do we do when leaders of our countries make decisions that bring death? What do we do when health challenges come up? What do we do when the humanity of others cannot be seen? What do we do when death, loss, rips at us, both close and far? What do we do with some of the things that get put on our plate, even though we didn't ask for it to be put there? What do we do when our siblings with a flat tire are on the road side of life. What do we do? What do we do about the wars we hear about? What do we do when we're at the crossroads trying to decide, do I go left or right? What do we do when the war on the inside of us is just as loud as the war on the outside? What do we do? Paul gives the Philippians some advice that maybe United may glean from. Stand in the Lord. Paul is saying to remain steadfast in one's Christian faith regardless of what's going on around you. Do not be easily swayed or discouraged. Rely on the strength, the guidance, and the promise of the Lord. Persevere, trust, and be resilient in the face of difficulties. Remember that song, I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the river, I shall not be moved. I imagine if I gave you one pencil and I told you all to break it, for most of you, I imagine, you could do that with relative ease. You could take the one pencil and you could break it. But imagine if I give you 30 pencils and I ask you to break them. I don't think you could do it. You could try. You could use some positive hocus pocus. But the strength of the 30 pencils would be difficult. When we stand firm, when we stand firm, when we say, I shall not be moved, when we stand firm, in the strength of our Lord, together we are like 30 pencils. We cannot face today or tomorrow alone. We are in no condition to do this thing called life alone. But glory be to God when we stand firm in the Lord, when we lock hand in hand, when we connect to our source, when we remain a united community, ain't no stopping us now. Paul says, stand firm, stand firm in the Lord. Second, to pray and seek divine guidance. How many of you prayed and sought divine guidance on this week? It's time for us to pause and stop whatever we're doing and have a talk with God. Y'all know I grew up Baptist, and we used to love to sing this song, Let Us Have a Little Talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer wheel turning, and you know a little fire is burning, have a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I heard a theologian once say, it's not about what prayer does to other people, but sometimes it's about what prayer does to us. Prayer can help to center us. Prayer can help to root us like that tree. Prayer can help to relieve a little bit of anxiety that's on our plate. God's got it. God's listening. 
Come, Holy Spirit. Prayer sometimes gives us a sense of what God wants us to do and where God wants us to be and how God wants us to show up. Prayer is deeply stabilizing. Stand firm in the Lord. Pray and seek divine guidance. And Paul last says, do that thing that you know to be right. Meditate and do them. We, the church, are still in the business of loving all of humanity, extending grace and mercy, and doing justice. It's on our marquee. It's been on our marquee for three weeks. Therefore, we love Palestinian people. We love Israeli people. We love blue, red, brown, black, white people. We love Nicaraguans. We love straight and not straight people. We love felons, we love convicts. We love rich people, we love poor people. We love White Sox and Chicago Cubs. Come on now, somebody say amen. <laughs> we love all because it's what God calls us to do. It's that right thing. Even when we offer accountability and walk in justice, the love is always there. So you all know I gotta throw in something about stewardship because it is Stewardship Month. Come on, y'all, get excited. It's Stewardship Month. And we hope that all of you all are going to make pledges, not because this is the place that helps you stand firm, not because it's also the space that helps you to be a better version of yourself, not because we care not just about ourselves but other people, not because we try to help others and always pray for others. Not because we support our denomination as it reaches out to the uttermost parts of the world. We want you to give because it's the right thing to do. And because y'all been doing it all along anyway. We want you to give because it's living faithfully. Our theme is correct for this month. Because of you, this church changes lives. We cannot do ministry, believe it or not, without you. Amazingly, this Wednesday, we will collect sandwiches. I'm amazed at how many sandwiches we make a month. And we do it because of you. We do open breakfast because of you. We carry kids to camp because of you. We support the larger church because of you. We show up when people are going through some difficult times because of you. We cannot do ministry without you. Living faithfully. I love this story about Osceola McCarty. She died at 91, but not before she did this last faithful thing. She had been living a life of faithfulness, and it paid off. About five years before she died, she anticipated her death. She was 87 years old, and she had saved $150,000 over the course of her 87 years. She decided to give it to the University of Southern Mississippi. Mississippi. <laughs> she decided to give it to the University of Southern Mississippi, her words, so that other kids would get an edu education and so that other kids would not have to struggle as she did. She was an only child. She surpassed all of her relatives, and she worked hard all of her life washing clothes. And she would just put away her pennies. And at 87 years old, she had accrued $150,000. She didn't give this money to a school for attention. She hadn't gotten attention all of her life, but she valued education and when an 87-year-old gave $150,000 away, it garnished attention. It garnished so much attention that 600 other people gave, and those 600 people raised $330,000. That garnished so much attention that Ted Turner, a multimillionaire, heard the story, and he gave a billion dollars. Things started shifting for her. She got on the plane for her first time ever after 87 years old. 
She received the Presidential Citizens Medal, the nation's second highest civilian award. Harvard University gave her an honorary doctor, doctorate. In 1996, she carried the Olympic torch through part of Mississippi. Later that year, hers was the hand on the switch that dropped the ball in Times Square on New York, in New York on New Year's Eve celebration. She said this was the first time she had stayed up past midnight. But she didn't give it to get attention. She was living her life faithfully and walking in God's call. That's what each of you do. So I say to you all, may each of you continue to live your life faithfully, especially when it's hard. May we always find room in our heart to put aside something for someone else. May we stand firm with our God and our siblings. May we love like there's no room for tomorrow. May we always pursue justice and give voice to those without. And when we find ourselves in difficult times, difficult times, in prison in our soul, when we cut on the TV and we see bombs being dropped, may we live faithfully. May we live faithfully. In the words of our sister trapped in Gaza, may God help us all. Amen.